What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are now following up for our second round with Dr. Stanley Kribner, Dr. Jurgen Kramer. Hello, you two. Hi, Alan. Good to be talking to you again. Thanks for coming back on the program. Yes, once again, into the breach. Right. <laughs> I'm really happy that we'll have the opportunity to talk to you both at the same time. And we wanted to start things off by talking about the importance of balance. Who wants to kick us off? I'll uh, start. Oh, go ahead. Elders first. Balance is a word that you run into time and time again in terms of indigenous and native cultures because they strive for balance between human beings and the rest of nature but they also strive toward internal balance and yet they're very very wise they have vacations from balance they do very exciting things in terms of their games they have very orgiastic experiences they take chances they take risks so it's fun to depart from balance once in a while if you can come back and reestablish the balance again. So, so balance often makes people think that, that things are bored. No, bored. far from it. The better things are balanced, the better equipped you are to avoid boredom by taking little adventures now and then. Maybe two footnotes to that. One is that um, balance really should be a verb because it's always balancing. We are never in balance. You know, if a tightrope walker thinks, okay, I have balance and stops, they're gonna fall off, right? So balance is always a process and that's just one of the most important things uh, about it. And really the contrast that I think we're making is between striving for balance, working with balance, you know, playing for balance versus progress and having a, you know that line up but really an evolution that happens by us constantly balancing ourselves with each other inside of, uh, of ourselves with the world around us and changing uh, b because we're doing that kind of work and I think that's uh, for me that's very very important no I, I agree with that ba and balance does not go up or go down. That's not the way it goes. But it doesn't stand still either. Dynamic balance is what keeps life interesting. Absolutely, yeah. And play is just as important as deep thought. Mm -hmm. I really love the analogy that you're painting where you're walking on the tightrope and when you think, I have balance, is when you fall off. So it's this constant balance being a verb balancing always in balance this idea of a constant ebb and flow and that there's never a period of stopping but it's always in ebb and flow always in the progress this part I'm, I'm, I'm continue to have some interest in this part especially the idea of having deep interconnectedness with all yet also having a directional arrow towards progress that is the balance. That's kind of the modernity balance that we're aiming to strike. Maybe. Yes, keep, yeah, teach. <laughs> teach. Maybe. Um, you see, I, I, I increasingly look at progress as an ideology. And I think when we, when we balance ourselves, we are really working towards integration. We are working to greater health, to greater I imagination, um, and you can call that evolution. You can give that a directionality. But really, um, you know, when you look at different cultures, they carry different imaginations. And at their root, they had different ways of balancing themselves and different understanding of, of balance. And that's really uh, the diversity of the human experience. And I think that's very, very important. And I don't want to presuppose that we're going in one particular direction or the other, but when we're actually 
being true to the work of balancing something new will emerge something creative will emerge because we are in that process of you know right brain left brain communicating with each other uh you know the integration with our emotional brain etc so um i sort of prefer that language because it seems like we're so invested in this notion of progress and progress usually is understood quantitatively right by gdp or something yes like that. Yeah, right yeah. you know those kinds of measures and i think um you know they may be important but i think ultimately they're they're misguided you yes. know and they lead us uh down uh, the wrong path why is it better that more people are at disney world or disneyland right i mean there's only one reason greater profits right but but really there should be more play and there should be more imagination and that's really what it's about which is of course what disney yeah. taps into i would say that there's an interesting example regarding the human heart obviously the heart has to be balanced in order to function but if you look closely at heartbeats you find that the healthy heart is not uniformly balanced the healthy heart has little jigs and jags every now and then this heart rate variability yes the only time when the heart is balanced is just before death so a completely oh. uniform heartbeat bad news bad news in some ways it's reminiscent of the greek gods apollo who was the god of balance and dionysus who is the god of chaos and you don't want too much chaos but a little bit of chaos in the heartbeat and in life can be a good thing mm -hmm. In which, you know, this is why native cultures, indigenous cultures, usually have clowns, trickster, people who stir things up yeah. so that something new can emerge. And they don't care about what it is, but they want to get keep the movement going. Yes. You know, it's mm -hmm. part of the aliveness. Uh, it's part of the vitality. And... Um, you know, we need more tricksters. You know, the trickster in the Middle Ages was, uh, you know, the jester, the court jester, was the only person who could speak truth uh, to, to whatever the king, mm -hmm. or, you know. And I think it's a very important role. And when the sovereign can't enjoy the joke or the tease or can't deal with it, then there's real trouble. Yeah. You're absolutely right about native people and how they build in this little bit of chaos with tricksters and all, but also they do it in their calendar. They have a regular calendar, but there are occasional festivals that are very chaotic. Mm -hmm. In the Plain Indians, before the European invasions, there was often one day in the year where people would act out their dreams. If somebody wanted to wear a beautiful garment that a neighbor had fine they got to wear that garment for one day so the world turned upside down in one day and some tribes if you wanted to run off to somebody's wife for a rendezvous you could do it but just on that one day i don't think they allowed women to do the same thing but i'm not sure i think that the Another aspect of balance to go to not American Indians, but Asian Indians. When I was in an Indian factory where they were making these beautiful uh, rugs, they pointed out that only God is perfect. And so the weaver had to put one imperfection in the rug <laughs> so that the rug would not rival God. And sure enough, there it was. You could barely see it. But finding the imperfection of the rug, what made it available for human use. Something perfect is only for the gods. 
So th this, this for me, um, you know, um, I, I love this conversation. You know, for me, it really means that we change our perspective and our thinking and our habits of thinking. Because when you look at something that's happening in terms of, okay, you know, we, we need to balance versus, okay, we need to progress, it gives you very different solutions. Yeah. And a very different care about the issue. And I think that kind of, you know, what we used to call paradigm shift, you know, in, in is really important. That kind of, you know, I mean, that's, I, I think, genuine transformation. And it's really hard because we're habitually so into this thinking and our language gears us towards that thinking. But is this uh, like the balance between balance and evolution? Um, <laughs> um, possibly, yeah. Um, you see, I think when your work is balancing, then you're actually not concerned about evolution. Yes. Then you're concerned about the beauty that you create, uh, the love that you generate, the yes. compassion that's there, the healing that happens, all yeah. of, of that. And, um, you know, when uh, there's this wonderful ceremony that the Karuk Indians in nor northern, northern California uh, are doing, which is called a world renewal ceremony, right? And it's the world renewal happens in, in their territory, in their land, right? But also it's for the rest of, of the world, right? And it's that balancing act. And it's their responsibility. Like when the Hopis do certain ceremonies, they're for themselves, but they're going out and that's their understanding. They're for the world, right? They're not just for themselves. So that, that's, you know, different from evolution. Also, you have to realize that evolution takes a long, long, long time. Yes. And so the, the balance in one person's life is like a grain of sand. I think the balance on the whole, the balancing act or whatever, helps evolution consolidate and get ready for the next jump. So I don't see anything contradictory between mm -hmm. balancing and evolution. Maybe from, from the way that I um, see it right now is that this uh, economic machinery is roaring at such unprecedented levels of sacrificing the ecology for profit that and there's never been a pause button this is another thing to keep in mind there's never a pause button on the machinery there's no such thing as globally taking a seven-day break from work collectively deciding on when that is happening every year at a specific time or whatever so that we can focus on balance which has nothing to do with economic production um well it does after you kind of finish it because then people are economically producing in a more harmonious way with each other and with nature but it has to do with healing with 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 uh with all these other um variables that you brought up about that process of balancing so that's i guess that's how i view it and how i hope to help awaken other people to seeing it as, albeit they are right there going with each other, balance and evolution, but there is just something so deeply uh, natural about balance and nature and the interconnectedness, and there's something so deeply feels artificial and out of balance about metropolises and the economic machinery and sacrificing ecology. Well, yes, you can take examples like that. The one that comes to my mind in evolution is some of the huge mammoths that grew horns so large, the horns became unwieldy and started to pierce the heads of the mammoth. And so the lo longer the horns grew, the more harmful they were with the mammoths, that and a number of other things just did the mammoths in. Yeah. yeah. So I think that the mammoths were a great evolutionary success for a while, but eventually 
they took the wrong turn. It's like the canary in the coal mine is like the man. Oh, that's, yes. Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, right, right. <laughs> so, again, I don't like to uh, glorify or realize, reify any of these terms we're working with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes evolution does make a wrong term or come to a blind alley. And uh, just in the nature of things, nothing works out perfectly. Nothing is in nature is like clockwork. So there's something that's very important that you just said in terms of you don't want to essentialize or reify these terms. And I think if, you know, that, that is a change in how we use language, right? We're using labels lightly. Mm -hmm. And that is so important. And in so many discussions, that doesn't happen. Um, while really those are little signposts to understand, you know, very complex issues. And if we actually learn to use various concepts, whether it's evolution or balance or whichever term it is, lightly and, you know, see it as something that we try to define, that we try to understand, but that also has a fuzziness and that is in and of itself in a process. I think that already would be, and I'm going to say it now, progress. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Well, good point. Talking about words. Again, I think we try, we tend to reify progress. And just because something is going apparently upward doesn't mean it's getting better. We cannot confuse progress with better and change. Sometimes something changes for the worse. And as I said before, evolution played a bad trick on the woolly mammoth, which eventually did itself in. And look at even today, some of the elks have antlers that are so huge mm -hmm. that they get caught in trees and they die of starvation. Wow. Yes, antlers were wonderful to use for battle, but every once in a while, the progress went too far. Interesting. And there was nothing to restrain, pull it back, and refine it. I think that might be happening in the civilization dilemma that you're talking about, that we want to move ahead, but what are we moving ahead for? What's the goal of moving ahead? Yes. And the progress, and you know, what you described really is, is a linearity that, um, you know, is, is out of balance because it doesn't take into account the other parts of ourselves, right? Our intuitive parts, our emotional parts, our imaginative parts. And so that's where I think altered states or integrative states of consciousness are really important because they help us to not be stuck in that linearity, but use other parts of our capacities to imagine, to understand what might not be taken care of. Um, and, and that is so important yeah. because everything in education these days, the way the educational system uh, is changing, is based on a paradigm of linearity, mono monocausality, and rationality where the arts and uh, you know uh, certain types of whatever movement etc etc that is always the first thing that gets cut while in fact for balance all these things are just incredibly important stem is important yes and there's uh, approximately I believe this is around how long ago it was, around the time of the Buddha's enlightenment, about 2,500 years ago. Apparently, there were somewhere around um, 1,800 different schools for yoga. And yoga meaning union in Sanskrit with the divine. Mm -hmm. That I don't see anywhere on the planet today. Um, so we're looking at a like you're you're giving these examples of arts and humanities being cut there's a big out of balance happen there meanwhile science and stem even we're still trying to punch the a in there to make it steam that there is something really feels out of balance 
about the way that um, we can make a nuclear bomb, but we're not spiritually enlightened enough to talk about why the fuck are we making a nuclear bomb. Um, and same thing with genetic engineering. Yes, we want to get delete the single point mutations that cause people suffering, but then figuring out how to augment our intelligence, who's getting access to the quantum computers right away, to the general intelligences, what happens with inequality. Yeah, yeah. And this is very important. You know, balancing is not anti-technology. Yes. It's, and, you know, it's about how we use the technology. It's not whether we use technology or not. Because there is a balanced use and an imbalanced use. And at times, you know, we don't know up front, is it going to be balancing? You know, at times we get into mm. a cul-de-sac and get stuck. You know, it's a dead end, yeah. you know. But um, so that that's very important that, you know, there there are potentials there. If we find a balancing way of using them, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, you started wandering us into um, um, altered states and um, integrative states of consciousness. Um, and you guys have both been studying this specific thing as well as how um, I kind of led us a little bit into this, but just how if you look 2,500 years ago and you see 1,800 schools around yoga, union with the divine, where are these schools now? What do... Uh, these different subcultures of of indigeneity around the planet what do they know about yoga about union with the divine with the nature with each other that um give them altered states and that um that kind of can balance out the hyper rational stem focused modernity well of course um, now you have communication with communication these different schools of yoga got to know each other and just by getting to know each other, they merged, they joined, they were reduced in number. As long as you didn't have a good communication, and each school of yoga was in its own little valley or mountain, you could have hundreds of schools of, uh, of yoga. But once communication started to come into the picture, I don't think people meditated less. I think they meditated in fewer uh, ways. This is what communication does. And sometimes the communication does surprising things. There are something like 800 branches of Christianity right now. And you'd hope that they would start to merge. Very few of them have. And now the Methodists are threatening, threatening to split because the main body has come out in favor of same-gender marriage, but a very vocal minority says, no way, we're going to leave the main body. Well, there you have two branches, two religions, we used to have the one. And so communication can also work against unity, because if either side didn't know what the other side was talking about, they could be just doing their own way, going their own way and never knowing what the alternative was. So like everything, uh, communication is a two-way street. And I think resolving these issues that are, you know, very profound and pertain to people's understanding or sense of, of identity really takes a lot of patience. And part of what we're seeing, I think, today is that resolving these issues at a large scale is actually difficult. Yeah. And the speed of communication is, is one of the intervening things. Um, because when we actually, if we actually were to sit down here and give ourselves the space and the time to sit down for three, four, five days and really explore what it is about either our approval of or resistance to a particular decision or uh, belief, um, we would probably, we might still disagree, but we might come to an appreciation and an understanding of each other. That's very diff difficult to do in social media. That's very difficult to do in the way communication has changed, you know, which allows a lot of globalization, a lot of fast communication, but these parts that actually 
because you know when 10 people sit together and they disagree with each other that is also a balancing project uh, a process right how can we talk to each other right how can we listen to each other can i have empathy and compassion with somebody who says something that i find obnoxious right how how do i do that you know and uh and i think that that's a capacity that we're less and less exercising well look at the boundaries of the countries of the world after the second world war was over we thought now these boundaries are here for a while we'll have stability didn't work that way now there are more countries in the world than there were at the end of the second world war proliferation of new countries in africa couple of new countries in Europe and even though a few countries are emerging or a country is taking over from another country those are counted out when you have the north and south Yemen the north and south Korea mm -hmm. the uh, India breaking into Pakistan in Bangladesh and even maybe Kashmir one of these days so it's interesting to me how things flow and change and just when you have thought you've brought, reached some stability um, things go up in the air again and you have something new to cope with we're talking about balance and I'm trying to show that Yes, it's by and large a good thing in a social situation, but you cannot take it for granted. And because, you know, I think well, a lot of the situations that you were describing, really, it wasn't genuine balance because there were hidden issues that were not part of it the. It wasn't balance in the first place. Right, yes, point. right. Yes, yes. 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 And That's so. Right. You know, it, it was a, a fake balance. I mean, it was really more a stalemate rather than a balance. And then eventually that broke open because the parts that had not been be attended to. Yes. Uh, you know, whether it was in East Germany, uh, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, et cetera, et cetera. Or modern uh, day uh, West Bank and Gaza Strip. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, um, then it breaks, breaks loose because you can't. And I mean, this is, I think, something where um, you know, I wish politicians would be more, uh, more psychological, because I think these kinds of balances or solutions you can't enforce, and you need to create the space. I mean, that's me speaking as a psychologist, for these solutions to emerge out of integrative states of consciousness. That's how how I would say it. Yeah. Right out of. Yeah. Rational thought, rational critical analysis, imagination, connection with, uh, you know, w with the heart, with emotions. Yeah. And if you don't do all of that, the solution really is ultimately doomed, you know, or tempor is temporary. It's you know? as though then the, the collective trauma that exists today has a there's a skillful and a tactful way to approach the healing um that does not cause further symptoms down the line where it's kind of this like fake balance it's fine buried in the subconscious is fine uh, and n when then t t two people of maybe a deferring religion live so closely together, if there is more open heartedness, coexisting love, interdependence and interconnection, then, and that's truly given the time of five days or a week of just focusing on that between people, or more, again, the pausing of the economic machinery to do exactly that, then it makes it so that 
the healing process is just the efficacy of it is so much greater uh, towards uh, maximizing prosperity and harmony. That's what, you know, Carl Rogers, uh, you know, who we both knew, um, is, was really uh, a master in, in getting people together who were highly conflicted mm -hmm. and persisting in a conversation that even after two days, well, it wasn't a resolution necessarily, but there was a movement, right? Yeah. There was a model of yeah. what could be done if we were to uh, persist. Now, you just... In the pr what you just previously you started out by talking about collective trauma and I'm not exactly sure what you have in mind there but I think it's a very important term because it goes back to what Stan said in the previous conversation because I would call the collective trauma when people settled and started to split off mm -hmm. and I think that's on the on the planetary level that's the collective trauma that all those people are still grappling with who have started to split off, you know, I call it normative dissociation, right? Where we are not wow. in touch with, uh, you know, nature, with where we don't know what lives around us, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's a very profound and largely unacknowledged trauma that a lot of people have experienced. You know, there are exceptions on the planet, but, you know. Is this fair to say that it's something like during the most pr primordial days of 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 evolution a couple million years ago that there is a uh, a very collective tribal uh, energy and then during these last couple tens of thousands of years has become more split the we move into the Fertile Crescent, we move into Europe, we move across the Bering Strait into North and South America. This is, and then, then we further even tribalize again. Maybe somebody sees this plant in a specific way, but then the other person does not see that. Maybe one of them begins talking to a, another animal more intimately, and the other one doesn't see that. So this is where these maybe differences start. Yeah, but let's not talk about the Bering Strait. Um, oh, is that not? <laughs> no, we're, we don't agree that that's it. Yeah. But um, is that, is see, that, is that really it, not? Is that consensus? Well, there are all kinds not? of problems yeah, with yeah. it. Okay, there, yeah. I mean, that's the least thing I think we need to say. Okay. That there are yes, a lot okay. of problems with it. Fair enough. There's so okay. much nuance there. Yeah. Um, we don't even know about these old civilizations before us. Yeah. And, you know, and it's a, it's a story <laughs> with problematic evidence. And there are other stories that talk about that. Yeah. Um, but what I wanted to say is that the um, indigenous Im imagination is, 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 is not collective in the sense of all over. It's always specific, right? The San people in the, in the desert of South Africa, they survive there and they can survive there comfortably because they understand where they are. And they know how to get into integrative st uh, states of consciousness to do healing and yes. all of that. Yes. And so, you know, which would be the wrong imagination if you transplant that to the Arctic, right? Because it's a mm. different, it, it requires a different way of balancing, a different mm. imagination, right? But once we get out of that process of the imagination, you know, uh, you know, we talked earlier about you know not idealizing or romanticizing uh, I indigenous peoples. You know, because things have gone wrong yeah. uh, there too. But there's something about the quality of the paradigm that is so important that we can learn from. Yeah. Right. Because we can't go back, but we can learn from. Okay, here may be missing parts that we have not attended to, and that we should attend to. And I think, you know, whether it's humanistic psychology, the revival of shamanism in, in Western yes. countries, or uh, transpersonal psycho psychology, any of these are attempts to get to these places because there is a hunger for it because there is this wound. You look at just light pollution in metropolises, children have never seen the Milky Way galaxy before um, versus thousands of years ago, our ability to 
to perform these incredible navigational feats um, across seas or across land or with our agriculture that um, required our understanding of the cosmos and of the way that um, different plants instead of are planted as a monocultures of, um, of plants are, are planted as um, with other plants that then create um, a more symbiotic uh, growth uh, paradigm from that. Um, it, it, I feel like it still comes back to this point of that if the economic machinery cannot be paused, we can't create the space for a week or two or four weeks straight of these great experiments that you're talking about where two people of in the U.S. it can be your classic uh, liberal conservative uh, in your uh, in your Gaza Strip. It can be your classic uh, is Israeli and Palestinian um, in your uh, in your uh, North and South Korea in your um, North and South Ireland. North and South yeah. Ireland. Yeah. There's so basically any of these points of conflict, or even in the U.S. with we were talking about this before we started. How even before we started the first show, how in Canada we just came back from those partnership interviews. There, their relationship with their First Nations, albeit still colonization, has a process of healing and integration that is at least. Um, it has started. It started to the degree where they start their events and say, we are on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, etc. Um, in the U.S., there's still such a lack of even acknowledging um, these unceded territories of Native Americans, plus acknowledging the systemic problems that have occurred from the transatlantic slave trade, etc. So... Um, it, we need how do we we need that space you said we need space for healing yeah yeah but that's what chris ryan talked with you in his conversation you know because the people the hunter gatherers and the people of um, the horticulturalists they work much less to make a living yeah. right yeah. and well what do they do they play they do ritual and ceremony yeah. And they attend, they have the space to attend to to community, yeah. right? And we always have these, really, I want to call them fantasies at this point. Oh, if we progress and if we use the computers and all of that, then people will have to work less, <laughs> right? And what has happened, certainly in this country, right? People are working, working more than ever and there is more stress than ever. You know, it's not like suddenly... You see these people, you know, saying, "Okay, I'll I'll see you at the dance tomorrow." Right? Median and male income flatlines while GDP skyrockets. Fifty percent of all new right. wealth going to the one yes. percent. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think that all of this can be applied to the human psyche as well, because if things are so well balanced, why is it that? A lot of healthy people have subpersonalities, mm -hmm. and these subpersonalities might come out during psychotherapy, they might come out during imagination, but many people don't want to get rid of them. They like them. They say, oh, I'd like to uh, perform as Chloe today. And at the end of the day, Chloe goes to sleep and doesn't wake up again until imagination calls Chloe out. But I think that there is a need for innovation that coexists with the need for balance. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the Trans-Pacific voyages. These are incredible voyages in their craft. They came to South Pacific Islands, then the North Pacific Islands from like Hawaii, but then in the meantime, there was an expedition coming on boats from Japan that according to the archaeological news of August of this year, got as far as Idaho. And now the oldest remnant of a habitable village is not in Alaska not in California, but in Idaho of all places. Mm -hmm. So there is a part of human nature that likes innovation, that likes to travel, that likes to see new things. 
Absolutely. And this seems inconsistent with balance, but to my way of thinking, it's a ma way of maintaining the balance, Absolutely. Yeah. the healthy yes. balance. It's the younger yes. brother, older brother, as uh, Kogi and many other um, in indigenous subcultures talk about this younger brother going out to explore and innovate yeah. and tinker, mm -hmm. and this older brother that understands this deep interconnectedness mm -hmm. with all things and unity, and so harmonizing those two. Yeah, I think the, the only problem is that the innovation and, and that has sort of taken off on its own without the support integration, you know, because we are curious animals, you yeah. know, and we love to imagine and we love to test ourselves, right? Like test by, okay, if I go across this big ocean, where do I get, Good. right? Yeah. <laughs> These challenges, you know, we like that that excitement and you know obviously there's nothing wrong with that it is well so what do we do with that how do we do it yes right and, and where do we put that and um and i think uh you know the technologies that uh you know uh, we've mentioned earlier they are you know incredible opportunities the, the question for me is really can we integrate them Right? Yeah. Or, uh, you know, you keep bringing us back to the economics of things, right? Is that going to be the major driver? Or is there, you know, will we be able to connect it with mm -hmm. who we are as human beings and what makes us human? And I think yeah. it's, a, it's a real challenge because, um, you know, it's an addictive paradigm. Yeah. You know, it, it's really an addictive paradigm and for me it feeds something it sort of pseudo feeds something that's not satisfied right? yeah it's a substitute it's a drug yeah in a way but it doesn't have to be yeah it doesn't have to be yeah right it can be that childlike play-like exploration and creativity yes. we want to get across that ocean or we want to get to the next celestial body because we're curious and because we want to do it in a way that is um, harmonic and at peace with each other and with nature um, versus that is um, focused solely on the resource extractive capabilities of us getting to that celestial body who gets there first so they can capitalize on that exact thing um, so there's these different ways of viewing it and also this whole notion of conspicuous consumption has gone rampantly out of control because it's just over and over again it's like 10th house is purchased, 10th car is purchased, 10th Rolex is purchased, private jets, private boats, perch, 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 perch. And it's what are these things filling within people that have so much that also don't realize that as they buy up these things like real estate, that what happens to the artists and the entrepreneurs and the other spiritual leaders in those metropolises that are trying to help catalyze the awakening are being displaced because they themselves don't get paid three or five thousand dollars a month to pay for these egregious rents mm -hmm. so there's actually there's actually a um a serious economic point to uh conspicuous consumption that directly impacts spiritual awakening um and that i'm still trying to figure out how to disseminate m memes around and stories that then awaken people to figuring out how we can maybe go back to some things like Lorenzo de' Medici, which patron Michelangelo da Vinci Botticelli into the Italian Renaissance. Um, so that seems like a very interesting thing, but it also just going back to the most first principle, which is an immediate return hunter gathering style life doesn't even have excessive wealth creation that creates these voids in people's spirits where they need to fill it with addiction to conspicuous consumption and stuff like that. So it, you mentioned that point about what we talked about with Chris Ryan on the show and what us we've talked about on the program, we talked to Stanley about and we're talking about now, just there's this, 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 feel, we, we, this most optimal way to progress and most optimal way to evolve and just that being this grand challenge that creation or source is channeling through us as we play the symphony is how will we figure out how to evolve and, and we haven't really you know i think the, the 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 challenge is to identify what are the parameters that help in that 
Yeah. You know, because whenever people say they want to limit something, it's seen as okay, that's taking away freedom or that's taking yeah. away this. Yeah. So, but so those how, that are awakened don't even need to see it because awakened people don't buy twelfth boats and cars and planes and stuff like that. So it's not even taking away a freedom. It's more like you awaken to reality. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but right. You're yeah, right. That's how that's, some but, people view it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think that that's that's the resistance because that's that's our habit. That's what's what's <laughs> freedom. <ingrained. laughs> that's what's ingrained, right? Yeah. And yeah. we we need to find a way to say, well, here are six parameters that are actually going to be helpful for everybody to be a bit more healthy and a bit more balanced and a bit more whatever you know, support it in their creativity and have a bit more time to whatever meditate pray sing yeah do yeah. whatever they they want to do because right now so much of that when you look at where it's happening it's privileged people who go right because mm -hmm. they have the money to go yeah. right or and those completely out of the economic machinery that or or yeah, or, yeah. The, or that's yeah. the other possibility yeah. yeah yeah so i think there's a lot of collective learning that we need to do and um we are currently lacking the wise leaders who actually are able or seeing it and are able to formulate it. Let's talk about these parameters because I have a proposal that I want to see if more people will want to get behind, which is why don't we take the, if you look at a hierarchy of wealth around the planet, there's 1500 billionaires around the planet. There's all these um, uh, leaders of countries. There's the comp these leaders of different companies, major companies. Um, then there's like a spiritual hierarchy where it's people at the top are the most enlightened. Why don't we figure out a way to map the biometrics of states of interconnectedness and then try and see how truly enlightened, awakened, these uh, billionaires and leaders of countries and, and corporations are and that's a top-down thing but then there's also like a, a bottom-up thing which is getting more um people to want to play and harmonize on music and art and all these other types of things but that's not funded by the economic machinery so people can't live while they do that um so i like that i, I like the proposal and just just blatantly, honestly, just calling people out. Like, no, you have literal psychopathic tendencies. Um, it's viewed in all these different ways. Let's take a biometric state of, scan of your body and see if we're right. Or if you are truly all love like you claim to be. Um, because I think Dalai Lama versus Jeff Bezos will have completely different <laughs> biometric signatures. Period. Well, I hope you're right. Um, and I assume you're right. Um, and I think, you know, uh, confrontation is good and is necessary. Loving, um, loving. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you know, when you confront someone, it means you care for the person. If you don't care for the person, you don't you confront, confront them. them. Right? Yeah. Uh, confrontation means you're already engaged, right? Because you're saying... I want to talk to you because you're wrong, right? But I want to talk to you, right? That there is there is that, yeah. and I think that's that's really important, you know. And we're not doing very well with that level of disagreement and actually talking about it. I think we we haven't figured out. You see, I mean, there, there two more things that we haven't figured out. You know, <laughs> one is, um, you know, utopian thinking is inherently is dangerous, right? Because I, I, we could probably come up within five minutes on certain things where we all say that that would be a good utopian thing, right? But then what does it take to implement that, right? And that's yeah. where things go wrong, right? Uh, and because, well, if the three of us think it's the right idea, then we're creating a dictatorship, basically, and that doesn't, you know, that just uh, never works, you know. So that's where many initially good ideas have gone wrong, you know. But the the um, um, I was going to say, oh, the other thing is the second thing is really we're dealing with a scale that I'm not sure that we have yet develop the capacity to actually deal with it. 
because when you think about it, everything we have said about balancing and indigenous people, well, those are all relatively small scale societies, mm -hmm. right? Which means basically, you know, which I thought was very interesting when I went to my, my first uh, workshops with uh, Carl Rogers, right? There were about between 120 and 160 people there, right? Well, you don't get to know 120 or 160 people, but you get familiar with their faces. You walk around, there's a certain comfort, and you know who is part of the community and who yeah. is not, right? You, you get to that level uh, of comfort. Now, we are trying to deal with problems with millions of people, 300 million people in this country and whatever it is, right? And I think we have yet to develop the capacities of how to to implement any of these. And I think what we need to learn is there are certain things that maybe need, maybe need to be done centrally and there are other things that need to be done very locally. And we don't know which is which. We haven't sort of come to that. And I think that's probably a science in its own right. Yeah. Um, you know. Wow. The, the balance between a Dunbar number of 150 versus a country size of 300 million versus the collective size of 8 billion and figuring out what needs to be implemented at a community level of 150 versus on a 8 billion person level right. and how to actually do that. Yeah, it's the skills problem, yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, it has not received enough research and, I mean, attention on all, on all levels, yeah. Well, one problem is the huge volume concern. For a number of years, there have been model communities, both in Europe and the United States, uh, planned communities like the one in Columbia, Maryland, uh, the architectural complexes where everybody lives in a huge house which each has their own section which are being built now in some parts of West Germany. The people in Hong Kong mastered this ages ago. They have mini apartments, M-I-N-I, -I, in a huge building Everybody has very little space. Everybody gets along fairly well together. This is, of course, before the current unrest, but that has nothing to do with these little mini villages that they have, these huge apartment houses. So there's ways in which community has evolved almost to the point of where you might say there's a collective consciousness. And collective consciousness is east of spot in animals like swarms of ants, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, in Africa, the uh, antelope running by the thousands, even wild beasts running in tandem. And I've seen this in Bali with human beings where a group of probably two or three hundred people get together and they chant is one organism. And it's a beautiful thing to watch, and people are absolutely in sync with each other. And this is not done rationally, this is where consciousness mm -hmm. alteration comes in. And they look at this as something that's a source of worship, because by attaining the oneness with themselves, they attain oneness with their deities and with the universe. Yes. So yes. the uh, masses of humans do come up from time to time and I think more often than not it's an amicable group but let one thing fall out of place and you're in the risk of everything tumbling, come tumbling down so that actually kind of got us onto the collective consciousness route a little bit. Um, let's also kind of, um, there's, there's basically lots of places within nature that we can take how uh, 
trees redistribute excess resources, how these certain swarm-like evolutionary behaviors operate, um, how our symphony as humans is also being played out, and how um, there's ways to redesign the social fabric and social contract for maximizing prosperity for all. On a, on a cosmic consciousness or planetary consciousness level, um, actually, I think you said before we started that you had some uh, ways that you wanted to be a devil's advocate to this, <laughs> to this point. Well, I, I think, you know, uh, when we talk about collective consciousness and cosmic consciousness, uh, you know, I mean, those, those are, you know, very important things and these experiences of, of unity that happen when, um, you know, people, two or three hundred people chant together, you know, I mean, that is blissful, that's amazing, um, that, that's wonderful. And I think, um, I mean, I, I see anything that is a cosmic uh, awareness uh, or planetary awareness really as, as complex. So as something that includes these uh, blissful states, but also uh, that includes awareness of our humanity where there is pain, where there are things that have gone wrong, where there are people that are suffering. And I at times do this as sort of a meditative exercise. I try to, to be aware of all the different suffering that is in the world. And it's actually really, really hard. Yes. It's really hard. Yes. And because there is so much unnecessary suffering, right? I mean, why do kids die? So many millions of kids die. You know, why are there so many people who are unnecessarily sick when there is the simplest, cheapest ways of treating them, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So, but I think that it needs to be part of the capacity of, of holding that, uh, you know, because we, we so often, uh, I mean, this is, I guess, my devil's advocate statement, we, we, we try to run towards the bliss, and there's nothing wrong with bliss, but I think the bliss becomes richer and and deeper if we also confront the shadow whether it's our own personal shadow yeah. or whether it's our cultural shadows sure. uh, you know whether it's the slave trade whether it's the native american genocide or as a german whether it's the the shoah the holocaust um you know or whatever it is depending on where you're from and i think uh, or you know right now you know the incredible inequality economic inequality yeah. or the shadow of what's happening at the mexican border right yeah, yeah. so if if that is not a part of that planetary cosmic uh, awareness i i think uh you know I, I i would call it ungrounded but i think that is a really important spiritual practice and ethical practice um that that to, to be aware of that. And so often these are situations where we feel helpless, right? I mean, I feel helpless about what's happening at the Mexican border, you know, what's happening uh, to the kids, right? Or what ha what's happening in terms of the increasing inequality um, that doesn't seem to stop. It's so. interesting how collective consciousness can be used in different purposes also you see a church choir, that certainly is collective consciousness, a group of monks chanting on the other side of the world, that's collective consciousness, and these numbers might go into the hundreds. And then you see mass warfare, and you see armies storming a fort, as, and that also looks like, mass, that looks like collective consciousness to me. Yes. So even though we are thinking in terms of the individual, and that has become more and more prominent with the rise, rise of Western culture, we can still see collective consciousness all over, all over the place. You, you said something that was so interesting, just that we, if we try and go towards that, that bliss without going through the process of actually healing the deepest traumas we could actually experience more bliss more play more love by doing the hard work uh i'm a huge proponent of doing that and that again just requires these shifts you see i think we've set up a polarity where sort of critical thinking and bliss are like they don't go together 
And I think what we need to do is, you know, we need to, uh, whatever, drink ayahuasca and have critical thinking, right? <laughs> and uh, and we, we are not practicing that, right? Because we just want to go into the, the bliss of that experience. And yeah. th that's good, right? But it can't be to the detriment of the other side, you know? And, you know... Um, what, one of the things, Stan, that I've always appreciated about you is that you go into these far out places and allow yourself to just be present in, in a totally non-judgmental way, but it doesn't stop you from critical thinking about them, right? And I think that capacity is so uh, important. Yes. And it's, it's not an either or, right? And that's what we need to teach in schools, right? That's what we need to teach in universities. Yes. It's you you like look at the most fundamental first principles of pedagogy and you find that currently emotional, social, spiritual intelligence in this in this uh current uh system and especially like the west and even in in china with going towards this gao cow it's they're the same style in essence um that remove spiritual intelligence remove uh emotional and social intelligences and uh and that's why we have that huge imbalance so when you do teach from a first principle to children that are being born into the world that your breaths of air are coming from phytoplankton and trees, that your bite from the apples coming from the power of the sun, that these interconnected principles are most first principled. And it doesn't live exclusively from rationality and critical thinking, but they harmonize. Uh, yeah. I think our task is to harmonize them and to integrate them or balance them. Amen. The purpose of this program has most recently been to mm -hmm. harmonize, balance these two. Yeah. Well, it's like the little penguin said, looking around and seeing hundreds of identical penguins, but I've still got to be me. <laughs> Yeah, we have sharing with 8 billion other humans, but also 10 million other species. And there's a unique instrument or puzzle piece in the big symphony that's being created. And to know that we are all one but that we have our unique instrument to play in the oneness mm -hmm. yeah that's another big thing that we've been talking about in the program a lot yeah. again this is another thing that seems like a paradox on close expense at, at, at close inspection it really is but from the top it looks like a complete unity and then you have the outliers or the exceptions well, that's the exception that proves the rule. No, I think that's the exception that's a part of the rule. You have to have the outliers. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I feel really good. I feel really good. Do you guys feel like we covered what we wanted to cover? That, are there I think so. Are there other points that we want to mention? I feel we're complete for the I moment. I think we are too. I think we yeah. really covered a lot of ground. Got Excellent. around the yeah. topic very well. Yes. yes. I think so too. Yes. I'm so grateful. Um, I want to thank you both. Wow. Thank, thank you. you Jurgen, thank you. Stanley, thank you. I just hope it gets you a lot of listeners and viewers. <laughs> I hope that you guys catalyze the awakening that we hope to all do from yeah. even these small little butterfly effects that go out um 
I admire the way you have your little studio set up here. <laughs> it's amazing. Thanks. It's so powerful. It's so mobile uh, This is one of the things about technology yes. and the democratization yes. of it. You no longer need multi-million dollar studios from a couple decades ago. You can just take a um, couple tens of thousands of dollars of equipment and just make something happen. Um, yeah, and it's, it's so cool. It is. And hopefully it can um, light up more young people to be yeah. creative around. So thank you for all your beautiful work and all the people that you get on the show. Thank you. I mean, there are some amazing too. conversations. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Always free, never paywalled, always creative commons. People can repurpose this content as they please. They can... Um, uh, there's never paywalls on this stuff so there's some main principles to our ethos that we follow and um, we also highly recommend everyone to check out the links in the bio to both Stanley and Jurgen's work and their profiles and their books those links are in the bio below as well all these concepts that we've been talking about on the program they all they both write about in depth um, so check out those links in the bio below and support them, support the other artists, entrepreneurs, and spiritual leaders in your communities and around the world. Help them flourish. You can support us. You heard the good word. Support us. All those links are below so you can continue doing cool things like having these great conversations and scaling our content. I'm really looking forward to these next couple of decades and the unfolding of the symphony. Thank you both so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Much love. Manifest your dreams into the world. See you soon.